Apologies. This evening, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Samantha Flad. She is a curator of archaeology at the CU Museum of Natural History and an assistant professor in the anthropology department here at CU. She completed her PhD in archaeology, sorry, anthropology at the University of Arizona in 2018 after earning a BA in archaeology and anthropology at the University of Virginia. Her doctoral thesis Entitled, her doctoral thesis entitled Access, Accumulation, and Action, Social Identity at the Homolovi, <laughs> Homolovi, excuse me, um, examined the archaeology and life histories of the three largest villages in the Homolvi settlement cluster, a group of ancestral Hopi villages dated circa 1200 to 1400 CE, located along the middle Little Colorado River in eastern Arizona. This research highlighted the importance of using both architectural and archaeological data for understanding what happened when previously independent and often diverse groups began aggregating into large villages across the landscape. In addition to working in this region, Dr. Flad has excavated extensively at Chaco Canyon and is now engaged with a major project at the Joe Ben Wheat Complex in Colorado. Her numerous publications and conference papers cover an impressive array of topics in material culture and archaeological theory and practice, including ceramics, ritual, identity, and migration in the Pueblo Southwest. Tonight, she brings together many of these themes for her lecture. I would note a very suitable topic for May, which is Colorado's Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month, Accumulating Identities in Trash, Examining Depositional Patterns Within Ancestral Pueblo Villages. Please welcome Dr. Flab. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to the Boulder chapter of the AIA and the museum for inviting me to come speak tonight. Uh, as much as uh, public presentations are always a little nerve wracking, it's also quite a privilege to get to share our research. So thank you all for tuning in and, and giving me the chance to talk with you a little bit more about what I do and what I've been working on over the past few years. Uh, so as Sarah nicely outlined, I work in the Four Corners region on sites that are ancestral to the modern Pueblo groups that still reside in the area. Uh, the sites I've studied really span several hundreds of years. Uh, they cross state borders. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple different, two different regions today uh, that address some of that, the Homolavi Settlement Cluster and then Chaco Canyon, uh, which are the two areas that I've worked most, most extensively. Uh, before I jump into it, I do want to point out that I utilize mainly museum collections and archival documentation in my work, uh, and this is the archival documentation of the previous excavations and archaeological research in the regions. Uh, and this is, there's a lot of reasons to do this. There's been excavation and work in the Southwest for over a century, well over a century at this point. And there's really a wealth of untapped data sitting in museum and archives, museums and archives today. But there's also a shift away from excavation in part because it's inevitably destructive and because it goes against the beliefs of the descendant communities uh, that still feel very closely tied to their ancestral sites and believe their ancestors are, are residing in and connected to these spaces. Uh, so when we work in the Southwest, one of the things that comes up frequently is that it's a very arid environment. It's not considered to be a particularly uh, hospitable place, although this does vary region to region. So a lot of our focus ends up being on migration and movement and why people left these areas uh, with many explanations coming down to environmental causes. Rather than focus on why people left spaces, my research really focuses on how spaces were maintained and how connections to these spaces continued, even after maybe traditional occupation of sites ended. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping, that's what I will, will be talking with you all uh, about tonight. And this draws on work from my dissertation and then some other publications that I'll mention throughout. So when we think about how people, why people leave rooms and why people leave structures and other places in the built environment, uh, there's been a really wealth of information and data collected on reasons people would move around. Uh, there are rodent and insect infestation, sites start to deteriorate, structures start to deteriorate over time. And we also see evidence for just 
general life cycles. Families get bigger, they need new spaces, more spaces to spread out as they have more children. Uh, and I, I will note here that I was very excited to end up at CU Boulder with Dr. Kathy Cameron, whose work has really been foundational on these topics and who I've drawn on for a really long time. So that was a, a very exciting piece for me. But my interests specifically are in how interactions with space are physically marked and what those demarcations mean for questions of identity. And specifically identity in the sense of how, who we are and how we think of ourselves uh, is created, changed, altered, contested by our relationships with the spaces that we occupy and maintain connections to. And I take a very practice oriented approach when I talk about identity in that I'm interested in negotiations that played out within these large Pueblo villages over time. So when you think about relationships to space, uh, you might, as I did, think first of architectural alterations. Uh, and if you've seen any of the, if you have been bored in quarantine over the past year, maybe you've watched some HGTV shows. So we know that architectural alterations are pretty, pretty common practice. And there are lots of motivations for people to undertake these changes to their space. We also see this in the past. And um, one of the things that actually spurred my interest in archeology span was this practice of sealing doorways, which you can see on this photo here. And uh, I hope you can see my mouse, I think you can. So <laughs> that's the line of the doorway here. Uh, so we see this effort being put into changing the way space is organized, the way people relate to space and the way people can relate to each other through these architectural shifts. So while this is still a really important part of my research and it makes up a part of uh, a lot of the studies I do, I wanted to shift gears a little bit today and focus explicitly on what I think is often a less recognized way to shift relationships with the built environment. And by that, I mean material deposition or what is most commonly referred to as trash. So when we get to an archeological site, when we look at excavation records today, Oftentimes, the structures are filled in in some way or another. Now, some of this is going to be natural. Some of this is deterioration of walls, uh, deterioration of roofing materials. Some of it's going to be natural wind, water, uh, all the reasons sediment end up seeping into the spaces that you occupy. But some of it is cultural and very clearly deliberate placement of materials that get classed as trash generally. Uh, and this is when we might note that the things that are found right on the floor are intentional placements, but oftentimes when we're considering anything above that context in the room fill, uh, so in this case, you can see this very thick, probably almost a meter deposit that's been labeled an ashy trash midden, uh, accumulates over time and becomes part of this assemblage in the room. Uh, and maybe we use it to date the structure and when it stopped being lived in, maybe we look at, uh, we'll certainly look at the objects that come out of that space and use those in our analyses of the sites. But we're not often spending much time thinking about why they were placed here because it's seen as practical. There's an empty room, you have trash you have to get rid of. This is the easiest way to, to do that, to accomplish that goal. Now, I think that we're missing out on a lot in the archeological record because of the way we think about trash today. Uh, so if you think about some of the synonyms for trash that we use in society, they all have pretty negative and disassociated contexts to them. Uh, we're trying to separate ourselves from our trash. We wanna get rid of it. And when you even think about kind of how we talk about other things in society, we have trash talk, we say things are rubbish, or you're trashing a hotel room. Um, all of these are negative. They're all seen as things that we would like to avoid if at all possible. Uh, but I think we're also missing a lot of other material deposition that happens in society today uh, that has more symbolic and significant meaning to it as well. Uh, so a lot of us, a lot of us still express our identities through our relationships with trash. Uh, just in ways that are often unconscious or not as uh, clearly marked or thought about. So one of the obvious ways to think about this is in terms of recycling, composting, uh, and the environmentally 
the environmental and sustainability movements of today. So we take a lot of pride in how we view how we dispose of things uh, and take and put certain value judgments and identify ourselves along those those lines and how we handle some of these might also relate to social or political identities and other identities we hold, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, you can also think of memorials. We honor oftentimes tragedies or negative events with things. We bring things to the place that they happened. And in this case, I think the important point is to note that these often go to the place of the event as opposed to only to grave sites or um, other burial markers. So obviously we have those as well, but we see this, this need and this push to place things at the event, at the site of the memory that happened there. And then I always, I can't help but use the Louis Vuitton logo trash cans because it was just too good once I found them online. Uh, but they also become a way to symbol, symbolize identity. And this is a slightly ridiculous, albeit uh, example, but you can also think about in a community, in the neighborhood you live in today, uh, we do care about how we come off with how we relate to trash. So there are days that trash goes to the curb. And if you are delinquent in taking it back, your neighbors might judge you. You're not jumping trash bags into your front yard. There are certain ideas about this, about how we treat our trash and where it goes and when. Um, and I think one of the clearest ways to think about this is the anonymization aspect of how we handle trash. So we don't want necessarily people to know exactly what trash is ours. We want it to go away. We want it to go to a landfill. But in that process in between, there's this uh, discomfort that comes with the idea of your trash being so being known and being identified with you because it's so clearly a part of who we are and what we do in daily life. Uh, so again, celebrities are a great example of this when you think about paparazzi going through trash cans and them being very defensive of where their trash ends and when it becomes public domain. So if we shift back to this earlier profile that I showed you and shift our thinking a little bit to instead of dismissing this large deposit of cultural fill as trash and instead of assuming that it was purely a convenient and practical location for those materials to go. What more can we tell about the people living within these pueblos if we instead think of this as a deliberate and intentional social practice that was being thought through uh, and that comes with a lot of other social connotations. So for instance, things like visibility and community. We I mentioned the community structure here, bringing your trash cans to the street. We can think about the same type of things. When we're talking about fill within Pueblo rooms, these are small spaces. These are not necessarily accessible to everyone within society. People may know, they're gonna see and know who's going towards these areas. Is it appropriate? Is it, uh, is it okay for you to put something in this space? Is it something that can even be disposed of? The way we view what is and isn't trash varies a lot based on things like socioeconomic status and cultural traditions today and personal connections. If it's uh, maybe you hold on to a broken heirloom from grandparents that other people would throw away at this point because it's broken. Um, so I, when I try to make this argument, I often use the comparison with food ways or how we eat food. So obviously everyone has to eat, but we know that how, when, uh, what flavors and tastes, who you eat with, how you prepare your food, all of these questions that go into food ways are very culturally specific and have a really important role to play in how people identify themselves. Even though oftentimes these are unconscious, we don't think about what is or isn't food for us. It's just what we're taught growing up. And it's not until we see something different that that stands out, uh, that other people may do things differently. In my mind, trash disposal and deposition are really the same question. What is disposal? What is disposable? Where does it go? When and who has the right to put it in different places? All of these things are really revealing about identities uh, and social relationships in the past. So when we talk about material deposition in the Pueblos in particular, in the Southwest, the term trash appears to be pretty misleading. 
uh, ethnographic sources and several discussions I've had with Hopi and some other Pueblo members suggest that the connotations of this term, the way we have this negative view of trash in our society is, is inappropriate uh, for Pueblo, Pueblo worldviews. Uh, so one of the one of the articles that I'll discuss a case study from later, my collaborators and I spoke with Mr. Lee Kuanwisiwama, who was the former uh, tribal historic preservation officer for Hopi. And he suggested that a better understanding of disposal in Hopi culture would be to think of these terms as translating to placing artifacts or returning them to the earth. So there's that added acknowledgement of the intentionality that comes with deposition and disposal. And he provided a, a Hopi term to us. I'm not gonna use that one today because there are many Hopi languages uh, and I'm talking about sites to different regions from the Southwest that have ties to uh, many different cultures today. But I do avoid using the term trash uh, for the most part in my work because I think that it, it becomes a way out. It becomes a way to not consider the importance of some of these patterns in the archeological record. and. I believe that archaeology should it needs to expand from considering deposition purely in kind of extraordinary or sealed contexts. So floors, burials, uh, very specialized areas, and needs to really expand out to a more systemic and nuanced view of what cultural deposition means more broadly. And that's what I will be, be talking about with you all today. Uh, so before I get into my case studies, there's a little bit more terminology I just wanna cover since I know I'm gonna throw it out uh, throughout my talk today. Uh, so the first is this idea of closure. Uh, and closure refers to this deliberate kind of cessation of occupation of a site. So it's a suite of practices with material manifestations that ends the occupation of a structure or sediment settlement with the added intent of either remembering or forgetting associated people, groups, or events. And this is something that Chuck Adams defined in a publication in 2016. And it really refers to this important shift from the traditional understanding of a structure being used to a recognition that there are further practices and further relationships that occur with these spaces after they stop being, as they are filled in. Uh, the other term that I, I use a lot is that of enriched deposits. And enriched deposits have been defined as a higher frequency of complete objects, exotic goods, or non-subsistence fauna. So rare, whole, special things. The problem with this is that it becomes a little bit black and white. And um, there's actually a very similar term that was introduced by Richards and Thomas that is used in British archeology. span uh, So in the UK a lot called structured deposits. And other archeologists like Joshua Pollard have critiqued the black and white nature of that term as well. Uh, because ultimately when you start looking at the archeological record, you find a handful of cases that are very obviously enriched or structured. Uh, the burials, the caches, the sealed context that I was mentioning before. And then you find a handful of, of contexts that have absolutely nothing that seems to signify uh, greater intentionality or meaning behind them. I think these are pretty rare, but they do occur occasionally. And then you have all of this stuff in between that you end up stuck having to try to decide where do you draw that line. So when I use the term enriched, I think of it as existing along a continuum and something that we can use to examine how deposition reflects different social identities practiced within ancestral villages by considering how, how enrichment worked in a greater or less, to a greater or lesser extent in those specific contexts. So I have a few more slides on terminology and then I promise I will get to the meat of, of the talk. Um, but as you hopefully noticed from the uh, introduction to my lecture and my, from my title slide, I'm gonna be talking about identity. And I feel like it is important to write to clarify what I mean by this term. So I go back to a pretty classic definition from Jenkins about how individuals and groups define themselves and relate to one, to other people. But I think it's important to clarify and to highlight the fact that these, these approaches to identity are really about processes 
of identification. They're not identity set in stone in bounded perfect circles. These are identities that people are constantly exploring through practices and they can, they can change, they can be altered over time. Uh, and ultimately they're very multifaceted and situational in nature. So you might have, uh, if we think about our identities today, at some point you may be identified more strongly, may identify more strongly with a family group, a social group that you're a part of, while at other times and in other situations you identify with your career track or uh, a religious organization. Now, the thing I like to point out and my use of the term, my use of accumulating identities is that I think it's important to remember that these identities are not all discrete to begin with. So for instance, your gender identity may have a big role in how you identify within a religious organization or a social group. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that uh, the Russian nesting dolls are a great example of this different, different people, but they're shaped and fit within the container available to them as well. Uh, I also am uh, not what you would call a theoretical purist. I think it's very hard to talk about any of these concepts without uh, tying them to others. And I blame one of my, my mentors, Lars Fogelin, for this. But uh, so I'm going to introduce a few more concepts before I jump into the data, uh, mainly those of memory, power, and ritual. Uh, so memory in archaeology is really about the social nature of memories and the fact that these can be contested and changed over time. Um, I give lots of examples of this to my class when I teach at CU Boulder, but I think Bears Ears National Monument is a great, a great example of this as the boundaries have changed over time. What happened there hasn't changed. It's not that the history of the place itself has changed, but the way we're choosing to remember it has changed based on political, political shifts in our country. You can also, the other concept I, I think is important to consider is that of power, uh, and that's really the ability to structure others' choices or control and influence social practice. So this is a little bit less of a traditional definition of power that I use because it's highlighting the ability to determine what decisions other people make. And this is not necessarily one individual exerting uh, controlling power over others. This, is, this can be a much more nebulous concept uh, with people who have the power to kind of set the parameters of what life looks like for a certain group. And then the final term I'm gonna talk about very briefly is that of ritual and particularly the idea of ritualization as practices that are set apart in strategic ways. So this falls back into that idea of a more or less enriched deposit. Uh, and I think really sits at the intersection of identity memory and power in the Southwest. Uh, in the region I work in, in the Pueblo Southwest, we know that power is very tied to ritual knowledge. What ritual knowledge you have is based on your identity and who you are and whether you have been uh, initiated into the appropriate society or are from an appropriate uh, background for that set of knowledge. And all of this is tied into memories of the place, memories of, uh, of these practices, of ties to spaces, claims to origins, uh, claims to other people. So ultimately, I think the practices of filling rooms demonstrates this intersection of these terms in a really, really unique and special way. So I'm going to talk about a few case studies. So I'm going to do kind of mini case studies pretty quickly uh, from two different regions that I've worked in pretty extensively over the last several, last decade or more. Uh, the first is the Homolavi settlement cluster, which was occupied uh, a little bit later in time, so about 1260-1265 to 1400. This is located in northeastern Arizona. The second set of case studies I'm going to talk about comes from Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, uh, and I'm going to hope that people have heard a little bit about Chaco Canyon because I'm going to breeze through the background of this region because I could spend all day on it if I had to. Um, so these probably look a little bit random. They are, they are somewhat. This is a little bit dumb luck on my part. My dissertation advisor, Chuck Adams, worked and excavated at the Homolavi Settlement Cluster for over 30 years. I got my start in archaeology with my undergraduate advisor working on the Chaco Canyon Research Archive. And I'll mention both of these projects in the background that's to come. 
but I also think they have some interesting and unique characteristics in common that makes them great case studies for, for understanding the importance of deposition. Uh, they both contain very large Pueblo structures of several hundred rooms, multiple stories, that grew accretionally, so they weren't built in one go. They show evidence for that relationship with space changing from the get-go. Uh, they have evidence for rooms and sections of these pueblos going out of typical use, not being occupied while people are still living in other portions of the pueblo. And they show evidence for a lot of filling of these spaces over time. Uh, and have the long enough, a long enough occupation span in both cases to provide that kind of timeline of deposition that you need to consider the type of data uh, that I'm talking about. So to jump into my uh, mini case studies, the Homolity Settlement Cluster itself is a group of seven ancestral Hopi villages located along the middle of the Colorado River. So this is right outside of Winslow, Arizona, which you have maybe heard of from the Eagles song. You can stand on the corner if you go and visit. Homolity itself is a Hopi word that means mounded up or place of small hills. So it's describing that local landscape of the, of the settlements themselves. Uh, while the, most of the sites seem to have been founded by immigrants to the area. There's a, there is a long history of occupation in the region, but there's about a 40 year hiatus before the foundation of the settlement cluster itself. And these sites are not all occupied for the same amount of time. They're not all the same size and they're not all uh, occupied ever continuously uh, or all, ah, excuse me, they're not all occupied at the same time at any point. So we see the earliest sites, Homolity 4 and Homolity 3, kind of depopulated as groups move to some of the later larger sites. Uh, people believe, we think there's kind of a diverse group that moved into this area. So we have evidence for people coming from the north with the close ties to the Hopi Mesas already. Uh, and we know people left at about 1400 and returned to the Hopi Mesas. But we also have evidence for people coming from the south and the east. And this, the migration has really been uh, based on ceramic studies of both decorated and undecorated pottery done by Patrick Lyons and Claire Barker uh, at the University of Arizona. So we have a good sense of what, what happened here. And my, my work specifically focused on the three largest of these villages. And I'm just gonna introduce the one that I will be using most extensively today. And that is Homolity One. So Homolity One is an 1100 room structure, it was occupied for over a century and we have data from 70 rooms that were excavated by the Homolity Research Program that was again directed by Dr. Chuck Adams and Rich Lang through the Arizona State Museum. What's interesting about this site is that the initial construction occurred in the Northern portion with kind of independent room blocks. And then they were slowly built together and around 16, uh, sorry, around 1360 to 1365, we see the construction of this large Southern Plaza. And you can see that in the reconstruction here very clearly. When this plaza was added, these earlier Northern plazas, these smaller Northern plazas were also raised. So these were initially all room blocks. And this becomes important for uh, one of my case studies, which is why I'm making a point to highlight it here. I promise it comes back around. Uh, so this is a large site with a really dynamic, dynamic history. I also mentioned from the outset that my work is really driven by archival documentation and museum collections. So I wanted to make sure to highlight that again for the homology data set. And this really made up a big portion of my dissertation work was to go back through all of these paper excavation records of 30 plus years, digitize them, create relational databases so that we could go back through and create life histories of these rooms so that we can understand what happened, uh, how they were changed while they were being occupied, but also how they were closed and how people continue to relate to these spaces over time. Uh, and as, uh, as Dr. James mentioned, we are starting to do something similar uh, at the museum with the Joven Wheat site complex um, with Christina Kane and Will Gregg and myself. So to give you an example of what that looks like and how I, I talk about combining architectural and depositional data, we can use this really quick example of room 701. Uh, so this is a storage structure that was eventually converted to a ritual space. And that conversion occurred through the addition of a floor surface and several features on the second floor surface. 
Now, what's interesting and the reason I, I like to use this as an example is that in between these two surfaces, instead of just building a new floor, we see the deposition of a really, really dense and large quantity of ash with numerous articulated turkey remains. Uh, so you can see one of the feet here. And all of this was used to kind of prepare the storage room for its conversion into a virtual structure. So this is a great kind of clear example of the importance of the relationship between architectural and depositional changes. Uh, so even though I'm gonna focus mainly on the depositional side, I did wanna highlight how these are really interacting interacting elements of Pueblo society. And you'll see that in some of the case studies as well. So at Homolavi, I'm gonna talk briefly about four different case studies. Uh, I've been very lucky to have uh, many wonderful co-authors to work with over the years. So I do have citations on these slides to credit uh, their work and contributions because I, I want it to be very clear that they are, are a huge portion of, of this work and data. Um, and we will talk, I, I chose these four specifically because they provide a way to look at a couple different things, uh, materials, objects themselves, the sediments and the spaces that they're placed in and how these intersect in our studies of deposition. So I am gonna go through these pretty quickly for time's sake. Um, I'm happy to point you to longer discussions of them or answer questions at the end, uh, but bear with me for now. So the first is on miniature vessels. And specifically, I wanted to provide a case study that focused on how looking at the deposition of certain material types more broadly across a site, so distributions across a site, could be enhanced by also considering that depositional detail that I was talking about. Uh, so miniature vessels are an interesting case because they are, uh, people love them. Everyone wants to see miniature vessels but we don't have a great grasp of what they're for. And part of this is because we have pretty small samples from sites themselves. So they don't get the same kind of attention. Uh, they come in all kinds of forms. We have bowls, jars, ladles, and discs at Homolavi 1. Um, this, is these, this example is coming specifically from Homolavi 1 only. Um, but we have a couple different arguments for what they do and what they were. And this is based on both ethnographic and archeological data. There are three main ways to talk about this. Some people have argued that they are a children's toy. They're small, they're toys for kids. Some people have argued that they are basically practice pots. So novice potters who could be children, maybe adults, are learning to make pottery through the construction of miniature vessels. And then the third argument has been that they are used in ritual practices and specifically as offerings themselves. Uh, and we see that, and that's been particularly in the ethnographic record, we'll see that in several different cases. Oftentimes these hypotheses are assessed using either data from the construction itself or the depositional data. And what we did, what my colleague Claire Barker and I did was look at both at the same time. So by, by doing this collaboratively, we assessed the physical qualities of the vessels for artistic mastery based on a number of uh, consistency measures and ultimately found that there wasn't a lot of patterning. The only real distinction we could find was that locally made miniature vessels were a little bit more likely to be poorly of poor quality and imported miniature vessels are a little bit more likely to be of high quality. So again, this makes sense if you think about uh, what you are going to bother traveling with, what you're gonna bring, bring in with you is more likely to be nicer. But the other thing that we noted is that there was very little evidence that these were used. So there wasn't much, there weren't many abrasions on the bases, on the rims. Uh, we didn't see a lot of evidence that these were being cycled through and, and used regularly before they were deposited. There was no patterning between the high and poor quality miniature vessels. There was no distinction that we could identify in the data in terms of where these two were placed, but there were very clear patterns based on the types of spaces and context that they were found in. Uh, specifically, as you can see in the table, miniature vessels were found mainly in storage rooms followed by ritual rooms. And that makes up the vast majority of the miniature vessel assemblage that we have at Hamala V1. Uh, so this in, a, this in and of itself may not seem particularly insightful or useful for assessing that debate. Storage rooms aren't uh, 
this is kind of expected. But when we started going into this in more detail and looking into what we found uh, more closely and looking at the specific deposits, we started to identify some patterns. And that was mainly that there were three rooms that contained the vast majority of the miniature vessels. And remember, this is out of 70 excavated structures. So the first of these was a ritual structure and the, the miniature vessels were part of a very clear closure deposit, very thick ashy midden fill, like the profile I used earlier as an example of how we think about trash. And this, the one room contained over 40%, or sorry, over 20% of the miniature vessels. The second two rooms were adjacent to each other, so right next to each other and very similar. So I have a profile of one of the two here, uh, but the what I'm gonna say stands for both. When you when we looked at the storage rooms, these are both storage rooms that contained these miniature vessels, we noted that they are two of the rooms that are under the plaza space. They're filled with ash, with all kinds of highly enriched materials, suggesting that whatever was happening in the fill of these structures was significant. And ultimately we know plazas are really significant ritual spaces for Pueblos today. They're important community spaces. So what appears to be happening is that miniature vessels, 42% of which were found in these two structures alone, were being used as part of the preparation of this space for its subsequent use as a plaza. So while this is the flip side of the closure argument, we're seeing preparation and closure being emphasized in the deposition of miniature vessels. And it seems like at least the homology one, uh, we can argue that it was in fact the deposition, the offering to these spaces that was significant. Now, if we had considered, if we had not looked into more detail at these deposits, it would have looked like they were just in cultural fill, in trash areas, uh, within storage rooms across the site. And we would have missed the significance of the way they were being used and, and uh, employed across homology one. So expanding on that discussion, I wanna switch to a discussion that highlights more the use of sediments in room closure at homology, and specifically the creation of distinct types of deposits and their contents and how this can be informative of shared knowledge and ritualized efforts in room closures. So one of the most distinctive forms that we see uh, of closure deposit at homology is what we call an ash cone. And I have a couple different images to try to explain this because I realize it's, it's not the clearest in profile, unfortunately. Uh, when we talk about an ash cone, this is a deposit that's formed through alternating layers of ash and then either sand or clay placed through either a hatchway in the roof, so a roof opening where the ladder would have come through, or occasionally, as you can see in this example, through a doorway. And it's a very controlled deposit to create this kind of alternating green, gray, or black ash with a reddish uh, tan sand and or clay in between and it creates this kind of cone shape. Uh, this is from above, so you can see how the layers would look as, you were being, as they were being placed into the room itself. Part of what's so interesting about these is they suggest a lot of control over that closure practice. This is not something you can create randomly uh, or with anyone coming through and tossing whatever they want into the room. Looking at the three largest villages at Hamalavi, we have 13 cases. So this is 9% of the total excavated structures across all of these sites. The majority of these occur in Homology 1. Uh, and I will point out more than about twice as many rooms were excavated at Homology 1 than were excavated at either Homology 2 or Chevron Pueblo, but we still see that that uh, outsized representation still continues. What's interesting about this is it is a small sample size, but we only see ash cones and kivas outside of Homology 1. In Homology 1, their use is a lot broader and seems to have been potentially less controlled uh, by, by the people, the social groups doing, creating these depositional events. The other thing to note with this is that kivas and ritual rooms, and this again will become important later, make up the vast majority. So 65% total of the ash cones are found in one of these two spaces. These are both ritual spaces that are associated largely with males in Pueblo society and at, at Hamalavi. So they seem to be a very clear uh, 
male ritual practice associated with the closure of specific types of spaces. Now, I wanted to look a little bit more into how similar these practices were. And they don't just contain ash and sand, they also contain in various enriched materials. So using those enriched material categories, things like turquoise, crystals, projectile points, uh, I started to look into the relationship between these individual ash cones using what's called a Jacquard similarity matrix. And the reason I chose a similarity matrix is that it doesn't count absent absent matches. So I'm not gonna have an ash cone that only has a crystal in it that looks incredibly similar to an ash cone that only contains turquoise because they don't have all of these other categories of material. Uh, so I, this, I realize this is a lot of numbers. I don't expect you to look in too much detail at these, but what I do wanna point out and what I think is so significant about this is that the one ash cone is, I wanna make two or three points about this. The one ash cone that doesn't have similarity with any of the others is the only ash cone that occurred in the habitation space. Looking back at the depositional data, this maybe, this is on the borderline of whether it should be considered an ash cone. It has a lot less control, a lot less structure. So what we're seeing is that while it shares certain features, it was clearly not as, uh, they didn't know exactly how to make this appropriately. They knew enough, but not everything. Well, the other thing that I wanted to point out that I think is particularly interesting is that we have ash cones at Chevron Pueblo and Hamalavi too, that are highly related to and similar with ash cones found in kivas at Hamalavi one. And all of these that are similar to one another are in kivas. So it suggests that there's a shared knowledge that's expanding beyond just the sites themselves. Uh, while some of these ash, while the ash cones themselves are a little bit more uh, clearly structured and enriched than most of the examples I'm going to talk about today, I thought it was an important point to understand it, an important example to use to understand how deposition is also a knowledge system and a ritualized knowledge system that can be used to understand parameters of identity and relationships, not just within sites, but between sites in terms of shared knowledge. Uh, the third case study I'm going to talk about from Hamalavi is ash and turquoise. And I wanted to talk about this specifically because instead of talking about individual materials, this really highlights the convergence of different materials. Uh, and this is the one that probably gets closest to the lecture you all heard a month ago by Dr. Brzezinski about assemblage. Uh, so I'm not going into that literature. Uh, he did a great job last month, but this is a similar idea of the whole being more than the parts themselves. Uh, what's interesting about turquoise and ash is that they really fit, a, they are really uh, opposite ends of a similar spectrum. So we have turquoise, which is incredibly rare and is generally believed to be really restricted in its distribution and associated with concepts of moisture, symbolizing that kind of moisture rebirth idea. And then we have ash, which is pretty ubiquitous in pueblos. It's created by fires all over the place. Uh, so it's fairly common and yet it is frequently used as an important symbol and uh, material in practices of renewal or purification. And we know this from a lot of ethnographic work and from work uh, and insights from our co-author. Um, so, which I'll, I'll get to more in a minute. When we look at Hamalavi 1, ash is found in about 20% of the excavated deposits, while we only find turquoise in 2% of these deposits. I should note that this is within structures themselves. So we have 48 instances of turquoise. Only one of those 48 occurs in an extramural area and therefore is not part of this study. And that doesn't mean 48 pieces. There are several cases where there are several pieces of turquoise in the same deposit, but there are only 48 places that we find this across the site and they're almost always in rooms. And these vary in terms of the context. So we do get them in room fill, but we also get them in more traditional sealed deposits. And that's what you're looking at here. Uh, this is an interesting case because it's a structure uh, so it's a, a ritual structure that had a hearth on the main floor that was sealed with turquoise in the ash and then sealed with an orange clay layer to kind of cap that hearth. And then we see the addition of a lot of ash and the eventual burning of the structure over decades after this initial closure of the hearth itself. So when we look at the correspondence, we can see that when we find turquoise in rooms, at Hamalavi one, 
in two, almost two thirds of the cases, that deposit is also going to contain ash. So there seems to be this deliberate association of the two materials with one another. Um, and this, this includes things like ash cones. So you can see the map is indicating ash cones as well as the locations of turquoise across the site. Um, we have three ash cones at Hamalabi one that contained turquoise and then two additional rooms that the turquoise was not found in the ash cone itself, but was found in the surrounding, the surrounding location. So to find turquoise in it to, at all uh, signifies that it was probably sacrificed. Turquoise is fairly rare. So when it's used as a ritual offering, it's intentional. You're not gonna forget about where you found uh, turquoise. This is, this is unquestionably an intentional act that's often used to commemorate ancestral locations and uh, honor ancestors associated with this. So our co-author and the current Hopi Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, uh, Mr. Koyemtua, noted that ash could purify or protect that sacrificed turquoise. And that when combined, they could be a, part a particularly potent symbolic offering Evoc evocative of protection and renewal through the proper honoring of the past. So this case study is really meant to highlight the importance of that convergence of materials and the creation of these assemblages of cultural materials within rooms is just as important as their individual qualities. Uh, something that we miss when we take things apart uh, for individual analyses of material types when we're looking at the archeological record. So my last mini case study from Homolavi uh, concerns gender and specifically the gendered use of space. So when we look at questions of gender, we can look at objects and also spaces that are associated with males and females. Uh, and I do wanna note this is clearly an oversimplified version of gender, but we do have reasons to believe this male-female dichotomy is, isn't significant in current Pueblo society and would have been significant in the past. Um, but I do think it's important to note that there are other expressions of gender as well. Uh, so we looked at two different materials. We looked at ladles, which are associated with females, and projectile points, which are associated with males. Both occur throughout the site. Uh, they, we have over 200 instances of both of these. But as you can start to see in this bar graph here, the way the proportions and uh, where they're occurring varies, varies a lot across this, across this Pueblo. So when we look at those rooms that were in the bar graph a little bit more closely, we can see that the ritual room, so the room associated with males, has one ladle, not much based on excavation volume, but has 18 projectile points and a great, much greater quantity when you consider that based on how much sediment was excavated. The mealing room works in reverse. We have one projectile point, but 20 ladles. Mealing rooms are associated with female ritual practice and are often seen as being complementary to kind of kivas and ritual spaces used by men. The ritual storage room is interesting because the ritual rooms themselves seem to be a little bit more neutral. They can contain both. Uh, and while this pattern isn't perfect, we certainly have ladles in kivas and ritual rooms and we have projectile points in mealing spaces across the site. Uh, it does speak to a preference to create that uh, correspondence between the gender of the materials and the gender of the spaces that they are being placed within. So I realized that was blowing through a lot of material pretty quickly, uh, but hopefully this shows a little bit about how deposition and really viewing deposition as a continuum as a whole, looking at all of the different ways deposits occur throughout a site, can help us get at the ways identities are accumulated and expressed within Pueblo rooms over time and how that knowledge and the memories associated with these expressions and these identities are demarcated throughout the village. So I think the, the big point I wanted to highlight with this is that the objects, the sediments, the rooms themselves are all interrelated in how these identities are being expressed. The miniature vessel case emphasizes the importance of these objects in ritualized preparation and closure practices. The ash cones demonstrate shared knowledge between groups at different villages in the cluster, despite it being a secret and ultimately uh, hard to observe form. The ash and turquoise illustrate the importance of understanding the assemblage created to get at its ultimate meeting. And then the ladles and projectile points show the convergence of certain types of identity. So in this case, it was gender 
that influences and ultimately uh, plays a role in later depositional choices. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and then very quickly go through two a pair of case studies from Chaco Canyon. Uh, I think it's important to talk about Chaco in addition to Hamalavi, in part because Chaco has a very different excavation history from Hamalavi. Uh, and especially looking at things like deposition are often and room and higher room fill. Uh, this has not been done as extensively because of the limitations in terms of the history of excavation, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, so Chaco itself is located in Northwestern New Mexico. It's a concentration of great houses and small sites in a short stretch of Canyon that served as a, a really significant social and ceremonial center for the San Juan Basin from the ninth through the 12th centuries. And I'm gonna leave it at that because I could easily talk to you all day about what Chaco was. And I'm sure there are scholars listening now who would disagree with me because uh, there, are, there are a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> Uh, so when we talk about Chaco Canyon, the site that gets the most attention and that I'm going to focus on today is Pueblo Benito. Uh, it's the most thoroughly excavated great house, but what's particularly interesting, it's almost completely excavated, 95%. But what's particularly interesting is these excavations occurred in the 1890s and 1920s. Uh, and these were really occurring based on work from groups being sent out from museums on the East Coast to collect museum quality materials. So there was a preference for sending back certain things and collecting certain things. So the project I had mentioned at the beginning that my undergrad advisor, uh, Dr. Steve Plug started is the Chaco Research Archive. And this really went about collecting and collating a massive amount of archival documentation from these early excavations and entering them into a relational database. Uh, prior to this, researchers had access to the materials, but it was hard to find exactly what you were looking for because there are pieces of information that are tucked away in diaries, there are pieces of information in letters, uh, and then there are the site cards themselves. It also requires money and time to make it to the archive and have the hours you need to spend sitting there. Um, and these materials ended up in archives all over the country, in part because of this shipping things back to the East Coast. Um, and I will, uh, I should point out here that uh, I am a little biased because I did get my start in archeology span working for the Chaco Research Archive. So I think it's a pretty amazing resource. But when we talked, when we were working on the archive, the point was to gather this original site documentation to create a relational database that collated all of the information we had about each of these rooms. And one of the things that became notable very early on is that there are a lot of things that were found in the rooms that were not kept. Uh, so you can see here, collections not retained include. And there's this big long list of the things that people didn't think were worth collecting. Maybe they had too many, maybe it wasn't worth the train load or the expense to get it back east. Um, maybe they were having a bad day and didn't want to have to write down as much uh, and ship and worry about packing it up. There are many, many reasons. Uh, and as I noted, there was a preference for museum quality artifacts. There have been some really interesting studies on what this means uh, and how this was done. So Dr. Carrie Heitman, who's the director of the Chaco Research Archive now at the University of Nebraska Lincoln has done a really interesting study on groundstone, uh, which is used to process food and has argued that they were underrepresented in part because of their gendered association with women. So deliberately not considered as important as maybe materials associated with men. So when I looked at this archive, I've been working with collaborators, uh, Dr. Caitlin Bishop at uh, Urbana-Champaign and Dr. Adam Watson, who are both fauna, uh, zooarchaeologists, so they're interested in animal remains. So we combined kind of their interest in fauna with my interest in deposition and including trash in our studies to look at distributions of distinctive animal remains uh, at Pueblo Benito and then at a few other sites. And that's what I'm going to show you guys briefly. There have been a lot of studies of Pueblo Benito. It is one of the most well-studied sites probably in the Southwest without a lot of agreement uh, at the end of the day about what it was. But most of these studies have focused on things like caches and floors and burials at expense 
at the expense of things that are found in the room fill. Part of this is because of the early excavations. They weren't screening most of these rooms. They were screening maybe one room we have clear evidence for. Uh, they weren't following kind of modern excavation practices when they were excavating these spaces. So what we have is a, an imperfect sample of what was collected, but this having this information, which all of this was entered into CRA, uh, into the archive itself. So when you search for a room, all of these found but not kept things without museum numbers are still part of that archival documentation. Uh, so this gives us a much better representation of what was actually found in these spaces than was previously, previously available. So the two case studies that I, I'm gonna go through very quickly because I know it's getting late and I do wanna leave enough time for questions, uh, consider, Consider this distribution of ritual fauna. So the first case is focused purely on Pueblo Benito. And um, we looked at the deposition and distribution of claws, skulls, talons, uh, and articulated faunal remains within the rooms themselves. Uh, so as you noted in the last slide, hopefully I had highlighted that eagle claw. Uh, this is because one of our arguments for looking at these elements is that they are more likely to be recorded than some others. Um, because they're distinctive, because they're ritually symbolic and significant uh, ethnographically and with modern pueblos, we can start to assume that people would have been more attuned. Uh, I am not a zooarchaeologist, but I can recognize a claw and a skull in a way that I may not uh, individual bones from other parts of the skeleton. So when we started looking and mapping out these distributions, we found two interesting patterns. Uh, the first was that carnivores, when it came to skulls and claws, were almost all restricted to the western half of the Pueblo, while articulated birds, uh, which are often macaws but also include eagles and other raptors, are found almost entirely on the eastern portion of the site. And this is not the best figure to represent this because this includes talons and skulls as well. So it's misleading. I realize there are birds on the, the west half here as well. I should point out that this foundational arc, so the earliest construction of the site, is this kind of, it's a little bit highlighted, sector right here. Uh, and this contains both. There's a lot of overlap in this initial foundational arc. And this has been termed a uh, ritual precinct by archaeologists like Jill Neitzel in the past. So there's indications that this foundational area was significant. Uh, but what our study argues and identified was this duality and the potential for a moiety system. So a dual two groups uh, sharing control to some degree within Pueblo Benito. And we are far from the first people to identify this pattern. It's been identified by many other Chaco scholars in different ways. But what we found was significant is that by looking at deposition, we're looking at the practice of this pattern instead of the intention. So the way we construct a site, the way we lay out our use may vary a little bit uh, and may be focused on an idealized version of how we want to interact. But showing where things were placed eventually gets at the way it actually occurred through time. So the second case study broadens out this initial uh, this initial study to consider the deposition of distributions of ritual birds at several sites. Uh, so we looked at three great houses and two small sites in the canyon. Um, you can see the great house maps here. We looked at three ritually significant birds, macaws, eagles, and turkey. And again, we found this duality, but on two different levels now. So when we looked at Pueblo Benito, of the 52 rooms that contained either eagle or macaw remains, only three contained both at the same time. So there seemed to be this distinction between eagle and the use of eagles and the use of macaws. And then when we zoomed out and started looking at the other sites, we found that they only contained one or the other. So Pueblo Alto has eagle, but no macaw. Pueblo del Arroyo has macaw, but no eagle. And the same can be said for the small sites. They both contain eagle remains, but they don't have any evidence for macaws. So in this case, what we seem to be seeing is again, a, an effort to create a duality in expression and ritual practice. So we have great houses that have macaws, we have great houses that have eagles, and then we have both of these occurring in, in the site of Pueblo Benito um, to illustrate the importance of that division and the significance of dualism operating at multiple levels at the site itself. 
So thinking about these two case studies more broadly, we can start to consider how Chaco provides a lens, the deposition at Chaco provides a lens into how identities were affected by practices themselves and the way people were maintaining and continuing these identities through the deposition of the materials. So the duality itself is, uh, is one practice and it's one part of this argument, but more importantly, I think is this accumulation of identity that we can start to see in these distributions in this deposition uh, that we would miss if we weren't looking at quote unquote trash and these upper fill in rooms, um, these kinds of overlaps that maintained enough significance and were remembered enough to prevent much uh, correspondence between the two. So ultimately, trash is a social practice and process that I think remains surprisingly underexplored in archaeology, considering a lot of what we do is look at the trash of people in the past. Uh, and I do think a lot of that comes back to what I talked about at the beginning, the way that we identify and consider trash in society today has impacted how we think about its formation and creation in the past. Uh, the thing that I love about this type of study is that there's so many different ways to go about this topic. Um, as you saw with my six mini examples, there are different ways to focus on sediments versus objects versus spaces, and you never quite know what pattern is going to end up being the most significant. Uh, and part of that, I think, is why it's a good match for studying concepts like identity, which are complex and multifaceted to begin with, because deposition is also a complex process that's not going to reflect just one identity all the time in all ways. Um, as I, my case study showed, this can be applied to both recent and legacy data with homology and Chaco, although it does require some, some important distinctions. And it helps us reconsider relationships with space through what I think is a more culturally appropriate lens or context. Uh, and on that, I like to end, I always like to end this kind of discussion by just mentioning beliefs today among Pueblo groups. So the Hopi specifically believe they emerged into this world and were instructed to seek their center place, which is at the Hopi mesas, uh, but we're told to leave footprints or evidence of their movements behind as they went. Uh, so what's interesting is in Southwest archeology, span the majority of us no longer use the term abandoned when we talk about ancestral sites in the region uh, because it doesn't reflect that connection. And yet when we look into the data itself and when we, we dive deep into looking within these sites and within these, these pueblos, we still defer to assuming that everything was practical and meaningless and carries no intention behind it. So I guess my, my final message for the talk is to really push for the fact that we can get to a lot more and better better embrace this idea of connections to space and, and ancestral ties if we start considering what that means for studies of individual Pueblo rooms. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, that rich, rich and fascinating talk. Um, Sam, I'm sure we have time for a couple of questions if um, people would like to put them into the chat. Um, I, I would like to start out, I was really fascinated by um, those miniatures you were discussing in the, um, at the, I'm gonna get this right, the, <laughs> the, the homolovin site. Homolovy. <laughs> Malaby, there, I got it right finally. Um, I wondered if there was any correlation between shape and the spaces in which they were found, like sort of vessel function shape questions versus so ritual spaces. We did look into that because we were kind of expecting there to be a uh, form shift. So maybe ladles, miniature, less, miniature ladles are placed somewhere and miniature jars are placed somewhere else. Uh, we didn't end up finding much evidence to support that surprisingly. Uh, what was interesting is that we did look at shirts, so smaller portions versus more complete, at least partial or, or fully complete vessels. Mm -hmm. And they all, they seem to follow the same pattern. So it doesn't, it seems like that uh, recognition that these miniatures are significant and different continues even if they're broken. Interesting. Interesting. Is there any evidence that they're broken before deposition? That's a good question. 
I would have to look into that. I'm going to be honest. I don't remember, <laughs> but I, I believe it's possible. <laughs> Interesting. Fascinating. Um, okay. So we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, one of them is asking, um, were there macaws? Um, at Chaco or at Hamalabi? There actually are at both. Uh, <laughs> Can you talk about macaws in general? Um, did they live there or were they imported or how oh, did they get to the region? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, so they, we actually do have, I think, I can't remember if it's one or two at one of the Hamalabi sites, but that's pretty rare. Most are found in the Southwest in the Mimbres region or at Chaco Canyon and specifically in Pueblo Benito. Uh, so we have evidence in Pueblo Benito of two rooms that are reported by the original excavators in the 1890s and 1920s. And they specifically list guano, layers of guano on the floor. So it seems like they were basically aviaries. Uh, so we know people were bringing macaws up from the South. Uh, we know that they were alive when they were here and that they were specially treated uh, once they died or potentially were, uh, were sacrificed for different things. Um, we assume they weren't particularly happy. It's we're outside of their, their zone by a good amount. Gets a little cold in the winters. Uh, but, but yeah, we know they were living in Chaco Canyon. On a follow-up, um, would they have had to import or bring in the foods that they would typically eat that I assume were not local? I Any think, evidence of that? I think they were fed corn. I think there were enough substitutes that were local and available. Um, there are a lot of great researchers who have focused specifically on macaws. Mm -hmm. um, there is an article by Patricia Crown at UNM uh, from Kiva, I want to say 2016, where she reviews all of the data. And then there's also a book coming out shortly, uh, probably in the next year, that's going to cover all of the macaw data in the Southwest. So if that's a particular interest, I would recommend keeping an eye out for it. Uh, it's being edited by Chris Schwartz, Steve Plog, and Pat Gilman. Interesting. Interesting. Kind of on this similar vein, I wondered about that turquoise that you mentioned and whether um, it had been sourced or where it might have come from. So it has uh, a really, uh, really wonderful colleague of mine, Dr. Saul Hedquist, uh, did a lot of the sourcing for his dissertation. And he also worked, his dissertation was, uh, was really incredible because it's incredibly collaborative and he worked with Zuni and Hopi extensively. Uh, but they have a couple locations, uh, Cerrios is a big source, Cerrios Mountains. Uh, there are a few that have been identified and they have, there's actually an article by Saul in Kiva in 2015 or 2016, I think, uh, that talks about the, the turquoise at Hamalavi one specifically in more detail. Excellent. I mean, it seems like just an amazing site and you've really um, opened our eyes to the possibilities of trash in the archaeological records. It's just um, such important work as we all deal with it in, in so many different ways. Um, I know that we're on a bit of a time crunch, so I will thank you so much for your lecture this evening. If anyone has any questions, I'm sure Dr. Flad would be um, welcome them by email. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all. I'm happy to answer more questions. I'm sorry for the time schedule. I have uh, this toddler who has to go to bed. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for listening and joining in. Of course, and please do um, keep tabs on um, the AIA Boulder Society. We will be back this fall. So check out the museum website, and our own website, or follow us on Facebook. Thank you again. Thanks, Sam. Bye, everyone. <laughs>